I'll speak uh, loudly for no particular reason. Peter has a portable mic. Um, announcement. On April 7th, I think that's what, uh, a week and two weeks, a week and a half, there's another jazz concert. The Roba Saxophone Quartet. <coughs> what I tend to say at each announcement of the jazz concert, I think that it would be uh, a good thing for people to come to because of the, the uh, sort of quality of, uh, of uh, the music. And uh, each uh, concert that I've seen, it, uh, well, on the one hand, I think that uh, they're extraordinary events. On the other hand, uh, it's, it's really too bad that more students and faculty from the school here don't go to them. I think they're not really quite sure what to expect or what they're missing. But this one, I think, is going to be uh, uh, particularly a good one. So uh, as, as well, besides the, uh, the students and the faculty, uh, anybody from the community uh, that's interested in work that comes from other disciplines, Besides architecture, that I would consider to be uh, equal to some of the things that we aspire to doing around here, uh, you'll be excited about what you hear uh, on April 7th. Okay. Um, I was reading to the current uh, piece that uh, Peter Wilson uh, wrote for. The exhibition uh, at the uh, storefront for architecture in New York, where uh, the, uh, they just had a show that uh, closed. Uh, we had approximately 10 projects in the show. And the essay was, uh, uh, was fascinating to read. Some things that I'm sure he's going to talk about tonight, but they're things that seem to be currently uh, being uh, discussed. Among all these nine disciplines. Uh, recently, I came across uh, an electronic, electronic apparatus. Uh, some people in our office, a project we were working on, uh, were given. Uh, it's an apparatus that simulates reality. Uh, they call it virtual reality. Uh, William Gibson called it cyberspace. Book Neuromancer. The, uh, the interesting thing about uh, the fact that such things are available to us today is that it starts to bring into question uh, what the purpose of architecture is uh, based on all of the conventions that we've uh, tended uh, to accept uh, both throughout our education as well as throughout the period of uh, practice. Uh, and what it brings into question is whether or not if you can simulate reality, and reality in the case of, of uh, cyberspace is, 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 uh, is objects uh, as well as uh, space, uh, brings into question whether or not one needs to make objects anymore. Uh,
Thank you, Michael. That was, you said almost everything. Um, we have the first two slides. And can we turn these lights down a little bit as well, please? As, as Michael said, I'm showing tonight recent projects. Most of them are from the last two years, except the library, which has a longer life. The li library began in 1976 with a competition and would be finished in, no, 1986, and would be finished in 1993. Um, two slides, please. Um, the projects tonight are paired. They're paired chronologically. They're also paired conceptually. The lecture has the title Western Objects, Eastern Fields, which is the title of the exhibition at Storefront and also a previous exhibition at the AA. The title implies two opposed concepts, Western Objects, Eastern Fields. It implies perhaps two modes of perception, perhaps one with which we have come from and one we are moving towards. These are all very tenuous theories. Um, I, must, I, I must give a few facts perhaps just at the start. Um, the work we are seeing tonight is, is from the Architecture Bureau Bollas Wilson. There are three partners in the office, myself, my wife Julia Bollas and Eberhard Kleffner. So it's n none of it is my own work. Um, my own particular sensibility is developed perhaps because, oh, I think today perhaps because of my, my past. I'm, I'm Australian. Being Australian in Europe means one has the excuse to be enormously naive <laughs> and to, to, to say foolish things which other people um, are far too sophisticated to say. I think this, this, um, this is quite important for me. To, to, to be operating now in, in Europe is a very interesting situation. I think Europe is changing very quickly. One really feels that the sort of um, the focus of a particular point in history. I think, in a wider sense, we are all at a, f a focus of a or at a turning point in history. I think we are at a turning point where one type of technology, mechanical technology, is being eclipsed by electronic technology. This takes. I mean, this is we all know this. I think one 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 is only. Um, repeating, as architects always do, a very naive version of a more sophisticated theory. I think this will, it will in time Im, um, impact on our perceptions of space. And our perceptions of space will then become, from modes of perception, they will become modes of production. I think this happened, this, this happened we, we know this happened with perspective, when the mode of perception changed from a, a medieval perception to a perspectival perception, the, the city spaces consequently changed. We, uh, the, the, the system of vision became a built system. The question today I think we must all be asking ourselves is what are the new rules of perception which may perhaps become the new rules of space? I have become interested through um, circumstance in, in, the, in Japanese cities because like many of us we're, we're working in Japan. I find Japanese cities incredibly alien and yet incredibly um, appropriate to electronic technology. What people call chaos is in fact just a, a lack of visible order. I think there are other ordering systems, social codes and um, media information in Japanese cities. And if, if one takes a model of Tokyo and, in, and overlay, overlays it on a European city, I find this a, almost a more useful model to understand the actual spaces we live in now. I say European city because I don't understand the American city so well, but I'm sure you'll be able to fill in the gap between Tokyo and, and Europe. Do we have a problem with the slides? I think we have a problem with the slides. The first two projects I'm showing are perhaps almost previous to this, this line of thought. They are one, a house we finished in London two years ago, and one, the Munster Library, although the Munster Library moves into the realm of media. Uh, it's rather hard to go on. 
We've, we I'll talk about this house in London. I can, yeah. It's almost invisible in this drawing. This house is in fact almost invisible in London. One cannot see it from the street. One has to go through this little archway. It's a muse house which was almost entirely rebuilt. It's by ourselves in another office, Chasse Wright, working together. The owners of the owner of the house has his office on the ground floor, and the upper two floors are an apartment. The house is is modern. It is white, abstract, quite pure. If one says modern in England today, people usually um, shout at you if you're lucky. Or someone from my office was actually beaten up from, because he said he was an architect. I'm speaking about the. Sorry, we have a technical problem with my slides. They're very well-made German slides, and they don't go in machines. <laughs> Our library's going to be well-made like this. This is this house in London, which is practically invisible. It needs to be invisible, because if it were visible, we would never have had planning permission to build it. Um, there's a a tyranny of Georgianism reigning in London. I'm quite lucky to be, have the opportunity to work in, in, in other countries. Um, this is our major piece in, in London before we moved to, or we, our operations become, became based elsewhere. This, is, this house is a, it's, we like to call it a box, a, it's, it's a box of tricks in a way. It's, it, the, the box itself is the container, empty, abstract, there are on the outside and, and the inside um, various pieces, each with their own, their own narrative, in a way, their own story. But these pieces don't add up to a grand narrative, a story of the house. I think this is perhaps one rule. If one, I said before, we were perhaps looking for the rules of, the, of our new perception. One rule one knows from um, Lyotard, the French philosopher. There are no grand narratives today. There are only micro-narratives, which, which are each autonomous. I think this is a, a fact of history. One, I, I, I couldn't philosophically tell you why, but I, I believe it. I find it a useful technique in, in, in structuring architecture as well. One, find, one treats the facade in this house as an abstract surface, and then as if, almost as if it were later graffitied. One adds elements which, 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 which speak, which have their own story. This slide is back to front, but I'm sure you can, you can read in reverse. The two main elements are this window and this um, totem pole. The subject of the totem pole is water. It takes water down from the roof. It brings clean water up to the bathrooms. And the English have a very peculiar plumbing system where you have to vent toilets. This thing smells at the end. <laughs> <laughs> like that. Um, this is a, this little piece is a sort of it's functionally descriptive in the, the modernist sense. The window. Oh, this is an existing house, a brick building, which looked it actually looked much worse than these. A very bad, very badly composed facade. We closed all the existing windows. We added one more floor and made this one big punch through the through the front. This big, big oculus. The window looks onto the back of these houses. Really bad view. So we blinded the window. Can we have the next two slides, please? <laughs> That's very good. These ones are all coming out back to front. The next ones. This is the um, water totem. This is the window. Because the view is so bad, we blinded the window by sandblasting the glass, leaving, but leaving out or leaving clear this pattern, which is it's a, a drawing, a sketch of mine. The pattern is like the figurative template for lots of motives in the house. Actually, my stick's not long enough. I asked for a long one. This piece just here is roughly the silhouette of that. It is a sort of literally a, a profile which reoccurs in various furniture objects and architectural objects throughout the house. So the window functions as a filter. From the inside, one only sees fragments of the outside, these sort of 
micro-narratives of the back of a Georgian house. Um, from the outside looking in, one also sees fragments at night time when the light is on. The next two, please. It's still back to front. Um, yeah, this is still the window and the totem. The window, the intention is that if, if it should function rather like Duchamp's glass, the large glass, the bride strip bear. The large glass is both um, a surface of inscription, a, some, a, like a picture where something has been drawn or written, but it also, because of its transparency, it collects the space behind as part of the pictorial space of the image. So when one is outside, one one reads this interface and the outside, one, one sort of collides them together and by moving through the house one, one re, re, recomposes the outside world. Next two slides, please. The owners of the house, well the owner of the house is a, a property developer who told me very honestly that he would never use me for one of his commercial projects. Um, but I think this is true for, all, for any of the, all the young, talented architects in London are struggling for work and all of the charlatans are doing very big buildings. It's probably true everywhere. This, this man, though, is a cultivated man and is collecting modern furniture, contemporary furniture. Every piece in the house was by um, an, an artist or an architect or designer. Next two slides, please. Knowing this, we designed the the arrangement of the house with this big space in the middle and this big space needs handrails but with, rather than handrails we, we, we made fixed furniture objects so ours become the center of their collection. Um, can we have the next two slides? Yeah. It's the German one. It's okay, I can talk just about this one. This is the front, do the front door for the house, front door for the office. But there's a sort of ambiguity there. This is the corner of the window. And the next two. This is the inside of the, this big window. One sees here, there's this fragmented view outside. Um, and around this double height, height space behind the window, we've designed three pieces. Um, nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> it's horizontal. <laughs> nope. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, yes. <laughs> This is going to be a long lecture. Yeah. No, that's... Um, I'm sure you can all read plans upside down. <laughs> that was an exploded view of the house. This is the, the big window slid down, wind frame, glass, structural supports behind, exposed here. And then the staircase, when one enters the house, there was a very inconspicuous door and sort of pops out suddenly behind the window. The main stair leads up to the upper floor, which is the main gallery space, the space where the furniture is seen. There are smaller rooms below, a bedroom and a study. The study has a perspectival plan with a very slit window in the back facade. The furniture pieces we have done are here around this space. Um, the next slides please. The window of course when the sun shines through draws the picture across the floor of the house. Everything is made from very basic, simple materials, sort of, this is wood or slate. This, the steelwork is all made by structural steelwork because it's sort of very hefty. There's no, there are no highly refined details there. Next slide, please. 
at the top of the staircase is probably the center point of the house, although I think a house like this should have no center. The house floats in the, in, in, in the city, rather like a ship at sea, because, um, through its sort of unseeability. One can never see, see the facade straight on. In the middle of the house, this seat floats. This is called the barge seat. It's um, somewhere between a handrail and a canoe. When you sit in the middle, you're sort of hovering behind the big window, and the whole house is sort of like sort of orbiting around you. Uh, this, is, this is the gallery space at the top here. The light always comes from above or below eye height, never exactly at eye height, except here in the kitchen. You see, I lie straight away. Um, industrial radiators. Next slides, please. The second piece we did is on the other side of the staircase. Is a steel balcony which hangs over the high space with a metal handrail holding up the electric control box. Um, one controls all 52 lights on the upper floor from, from here. It's sort of like the Starship Enterprise. When one gets to the top, one has to sort of set, the, set, set the course of the room. And the next two slides, please. And on the third side, is this vitrine, this box for dis displaying objects. We've done a lot of other little pieces around the house. I think far too many to go through tonight. This rather looks like a seller's catalogue when one goes through everything bit by bit. This is a, a, a CD storage cupboard. Um, I said before, and I'm, I'm, I'm technically very naive as well. I'm, I'm very bad on a computer. And when I designed this house, I'd never actually held a CD in my hand. It was very embarrassing. I had to ask the client how big they were. Um, this question of, of, of I think, a, a CD, a compact disc, something which is sort of almost magical. It, it, it makes beautiful sound, and yet when, when one looks at it, it's sort of, it's almost not there. The question is of how, to, how almost to find a, a, a home for an object like that. We chose just to make something very, almost primitive. We made this cupboard with a really heavy door. The door is four inches thick wood. So one has to grab something substantial before one reaches in to find something insubstantial. Behind is a very simple metal box. We also designed little things like this shelf for the Bang Olufsen. Next slides, please. The staircase, which we saw before, cuts diagonally through a wall and is seen in the entrance hall as this negative, or no, this positive silhouette. This is it's back to front, but you can reverse yourselves. Um, it's a concept from Baudrillard, reversal. Um, yeah, this is, one sees on, on one side this um, stair, the stair which is actually built as a beam getting smaller and smaller to the top. And on the other side, um, a lot of these things are designed from, with what we call practical opportunities, things one has to do. One has to, for the fire officer, clad this in plaster. We, in, the intention was to expose the wood, but this is not allowed in English building law. The plaster was this very beautiful pink color, so we painted the wall but not the stair. I think these are very, this, these ideas that things actually, once one sets the subject or the geometry, they take on a life of their own. They're, through their materializing, they actually grow a character. This idea of, of character, of figuration, I think runs through all of our projects. Next slides, please. Um, we're still on our first group of, or first pair of projects. This house was finished in London um, two years ago. About this, or while working on the design of the house, we, we did, did the Munster Library competition and won the first prize and have been working towards its, its construction since. You probably don't know Munster, very few people know Munster. It's a, a city of half a million people in the north of Germany. It looks like this on the right. It's visited by tourists as a medieval city. These buildings are from the 1950s and 1960s. It was bombed flat in the Second World War. 
I find this fantastic, this, this idea of, of simulation. This is a simulated city. Um, one has to be very careful how one says this in Germany because it's, it, it, it's also very precious. The people of, of the city um, take, it very, take these buildings very seriously. They represent the communality of the city. This is, this is, a, this is almost a, a theatre space for, the, for public life in Münster. Our library is only one street away from the Principalmarkt, this main shopping street. The plan structure of the city is, is still medieval. It, it, it has the star-shaped fortifications and all the, all the streets from the sort of 1100s, 1200s. But all the building fabric was destroyed in the Second World War. So one has this curious contradiction between two and three dimensions. One has to be very, I think, when in building in any European city, one, one has to be aware of the contextualist game. It's, it's very difficult to do an, um, um, a blatantly, um, or building blatantly disregarding its context. But on the other hand, one has to also qualify the situation. One doesn't do a building which, which pretends to be one of these buildings. One has to maintain a sort of, um, one's um, dignity as, as, a, as a contemporary architect to make them, to make them the mark of, of our time as these make the mark of their time. This is our library. Um, 10,000 square meters, two buildings with a, 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 a new street cutting through the middle, basically making two building forms, although they're connected underground. The materials are white plaster, abstract, like the London house and copper roofs. Next two slides, please. One sees here how the building fits the plan of the city. There are three different readings of this, this, this cutting between the two, the two slabs. This is the, the basic theme. The first reading is the contextual one. There's a church, this one here. It's not the main cathedral. The main cathedral is there, but on the eastern axis is the second church. This is the main shopping street. And continuing, this, this axis runs across our site. Um, it's very powerful when one stands here, one looks up at 30 degrees, an enormously high spire. Uh, this was one reason for making this cut. The other is that all the other buildings in the city, because of the medieval plan, are quite small in, in, in plan area. And to, do, to put the entire program in one building would make an, an out-of-scale object. So we, we, we cut it in two. The other intention is to close this triangular block with a side here. So one plays the, the block game. If you don't play the block game in Germany, they get upset as well. But then we close the block a second time. So one poses this question, what is a block with two edges? I mean, is, a, is, it, is it still a block? Um, it's sort of like define or um, conjugating a verb, sort of two, you know, I block, you block, or something. <laughs> Um, the outer edge is, is, is the, the facade of our building, a very hard edge. Um, to the inner street and, and to, the, to the east, the building is, is, is of glass and very open. This is the pedestrian area of the city. Next two slides, please. The second... Um, oh, wait a minute. The next reason for dividing the building or is, or one is the axis, then the block, then there's the programmatic reason. Um, the program for this library is the first in Germany to take in, in, into account new, new technology, the fact that catalogues are stored on microfiche. Well, I think in, in fact that the whole status of the library is, is questioned by electronic technology. One knows the quote from Victor Hugo, or some of the book held in front of Notre Dame and the statement, this will kill that. When printing is, is, is invented and universal literacy spreads across Europe, the book becomes, becomes the, the new container of knowledge. Before that, it was the building, the Gothic cathedral. In the Middle Ages, the cathedrals could be read. Later, the books can be read, so the, 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 the book has killed the building. Today, information becomes in, invisible, so the book, in, in turn, is itself killed. So what happens to the library? The library is the, the storehouse of books. I think this is, it's perhaps a part of a longer conversation, but the, the history of library is, libraries are the history, or is the history of representing knowledge, um, from Boulay's library or the, 
library of Le, Le Brust in, in Paris with the writing of the author's names on the outside or Asplund's library, this sort of perfect drum, perhaps the last statement of the possible completion of a classical world. Ours has a sort of a broken drum. The broken drum is where the books are found. This, this building volume, this half ship, is the building for books. The other building, the slab, is the building of pure information. The catalogues are in the pure information, in, or in, in the pure information building. In the catalogues, one finds only the title of the book, its size, the number of pages, the author, where it was published, not the object itself. One also finds this information on, on um, VDU screens. The library has a, a zone, a sort of a middle zone, which doesn't usually exist in, in a library, which is like an information supermarket. It actually has to be planned like a supermarket with some sort of stalls selling things, um, where you check your books out is the equivalent of the cashier. There we have to have little sort of buckets. This is where you pick up cigarettes and chewing gum in a supermarket. This is where people sort of casually take something home with them from the library. The ground floor of this building is this information supermarket where one gets information on the city, on new books, on hobbies, on gardening, on whatever, on, on whatever is sort of contemporary and not particularly um, academic. At the front of the library is the, the entrance here. This is not, not, not a little figurative incident. This is like a little monster with legs one has to walk between to get in. Cafe Terrace here. The top floors are offices in this, this slab. Next two slides, please. Yeah, one sees what I was talking, saying that here. The plan of this is the book building with the outside wall lined with books, and then just one book stack in 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 the middle, and then these are reading spaces around the edge, each with different conditions of breaking the, this outside facade. Reading terrace here. This is the entrance sequence: cafe, newspaper reading, salon. This check-in and check-out island here. One sees this is the missing half of this ship at a different scale. When one arrives, one moves through the, news, through the information supermarket on the ground floor, then up these stairs. And halfway between the two halves on this bridge is the main information desk. So it's, it's neither, neither in one side nor the other. It's straddling. The building is also connected in, in the basement. This is the sound library, which is neither pure object nor, nor purely invisible. These spaces, or this, this street has is, have these copper walls on both sides which will fold down. It's as if the building is being cut and then patched with these copper walls. They don't reach the ground. Underneath is glass. So when one stands in the middle of this street, one can see the entire ground plane of the building. It's sort of at eye height. One sees, so one is actually in the middle of the building before entering it. It's, it's, it's a, so breaking down this classical relationship of public space, facade, internal space, when he's actually in before, before one enters. This is the copper facade to the information building, glass underneath. The same elevation with the facade taken off and the actual wall of the building behind cut away so that people move in and out of these columns as they move through the information supermarket. Next two slides, please. This is a perspective drawing from our competition entry of this space un underneath the copper roof. It's um, this wood paneled facade from here. Always light comes from above in this zone. This is a study model showing this perspec perspective is looking down this space. These are um, glue lamb beams. One can't use steel for fire reasons. In, but I like very much these bone-like things holding up this copper wall, the glass underneath, light from the top. The staircases are always un, un, underneath this, this copper roof. This is the main staircase in the book building, which goes from the top right to the bottom. In the book zones, we have all our mechanical servicing in this thick ceiling. It has this real, sort of, it's like a building within a building. Here, light comes from the top. This is south, where the light reflects off this roof and down here, right to the basement, further back. Next two slides, please. Um, the Munster Library is a long project. I think one could do a whole lecture on it, or one, I hope to, in a few years' time. Our situation in Europe, or, or our office is now very busy in Europe. 
Um, I'll describe the European projects first, the Western objects. I think all of our Western buildings are heavy buildings, earthbound buildings. Somehow they are, in a way, tra tra traditional because they, 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 they don't in any way try to be, to be transparent, to be light or ephemeral objects. This is a very heavy object. This is a building which will perhaps, we hope, be built in, in Krakow, in Poland. The situation in Europe now, as I've said already, I think, is very interesting. This idea that there's a, suddenly one takes, a, takes a, a, away a mirror and finds a whole space behind. There's this whole other frontier. There's a very interesting sort of flow of information and exchanges happening at the moment. We've been invited by a Polish architectural office who's doing, doing something like the EBA, but in Krakow, to do an urban villa. This is a very quite simple, quite solid, quite just modernist piece. The Poles have a very unfortunate linkage of the concept of freedom and the concept of postmodernism. Charles Jenks went at just the wrong time. And if one criticizes postmodernism, one is criticizing freedom, which is a very uh, tragedy of history. So one is trying to do a, um, a modernist building, and the Poles have a very, very fine modernist tradition. I think actually the, the better Polish architects are, are, are doing modern buildings now anyway. This is a kindergarten we're building for the city of Frankfurt. Um, our European buildings are all, nearly all for public clients, um, a kindergarten for the city, or this is um, social housing or the library for the city of Münster. I think each time these buildings are somehow, well, the, the, the library in Münster is seen by the people of Münster as their building. They all, it's in the newspapers very often. One thinks it's a very, very good, very fine role for architecture as representing, representing the community. I mean, the people in Münster, I think, are aware that the library will make Münster a far more interesting cultural city than, than the five other cities near Münster. This is a very good role for architecture. Every city in Germany wants to be an interesting cultural city, and so every city wants a, a new library, a new theatre, new kindergartens. It's very good for architects. This is a small kindergarten. The city of Frankfurt, after their, mu their mu museum building program, are now doing smaller buildings. They've invited 15 architects each to do kindergartens in the periphery. This one has many of the other themes of small figurative objects, like this one. This is a it's called the Metzwekraum. This is a general use room where the children sleep, the small children sleep at midday. It's a very enclosing room, a womb, perhaps. It has, hopefully, um, a, a roof which can be used as a playground as well, which is sort of sloping, almost a, a sort of a simulated surface of the earth with, with its, its own horizon. As one walks up and down this surface, scales are, are dis distorted. The idea is that the children can play this game of growing up or growing down. Next two slides, please. Um, I think perhaps one of the other, or another rule one can say is, is um, relevant today is that the distance has become um, invalidated by our technology. That when I sit in Münster, Münster is as close, or I'm as close to the next room as I am to Tokyo with a fax machine. I think this idea that uh, the, the idea of scale it becomes, comes in, in into question. We find ourselves dealing sometimes on urban with urban planning con, um, projects and dealing with the planning a whole city. Sometimes doing furniture objects or very small objects, but the concepts one deals with are the same. Somehow there is no appropriate concept to an appropriate scale anymore. I think. Things are interchangeable. This is a very small object, a bridge. We built um, an installation in an art exhibition in Holland last summer. A very simple bridge. Many of our projects are bridges. It's a theme we like very much. The bridge connects across a dike to an island where there's an old fort where 15 or 20 artists did installations. The idea was that it would be an entrance. We found out a week before the opening that people were not allowed to cross because then they wouldn't pay money and they had to go through an Aldo Rossi pavilion to pay money. Um, I like this very much. This is an, another one of these practical opportunities. One knows the um, essay from, from Heidegger called um, Baun von Denken, Building, Dwelling, Thinking, where he uses the metaphor of the bridge for the, the built structure 
where the idea of the bridge makes a site, it makes a place in the world unique. This idea of, of crossing the bridge is a sort of this ritual path, this sort of gathering which happens on a bridge. But one knows also that today perhaps we're becoming more divorced from our objects. Baudrillard has said that objects are becoming in, indifferent to their subject. So here we find a bridge which is indifferent to its subject, the user. The, the user cannot cross. But um, to quote Heidegger, 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 Heidegger's essay gets a wonderful point where he reduces and reduces what, what is the bridge, what is the bridge, and he gets to the statement with the sentence, the bridge bridges. I think this is fantastic. The, the, the object does what the, what the object is. This bridge bridges, but the crosser doesn't. The crosser then is left sort of in, in, in the middle, looking down at the water, sort of at the landscape. At this point, the one is sort of challenged. One has to say, well, what am I doing here? What is this place I'm in? And then one, hopefully, one realizes one has been led from quite low down, near the water, where one cannot see the landscape, up the bridge to, where the, to the point where the landscape is slowly revealed. And then one must turn, turn around and go back and look at the other installations. Next two slides, please. This is going to take a long time. I'll try to go f quicker. That was the introduction. Um, two competitions now from our office in the last few months. This is um, a building, building called the, the Center for Art and Media Technology. It is meant to be a new science museum in Germany, the equivalent of the Science Museum at La Villette. Um, it is meant to be, in fact, the house of media technology, what I've been talking about. It was an invited competition for 15 or so architects. We had the second prize. Rem Kuhlhaus is winning and building a very fine building in Karlsruhe. Our concept is based on this idea of how does one, or of, of, of representation, how does one represent um, something which is basically invisible, the technology today. One cannot use the facade. I think the facade is this sort of, this classical surface which faces a, a public space. Because of this site, there, there, there are no facades. The site is between railway lines here, the main station, and the autobahn entrance to the city, roads here. There's a long avenue of trees, but the site is basically linear and basically buried. So there are, are, are no representative facades. We chose instead to use the fifth facade, the roof, as the representative surface. But to use the roof as the interface, I think the interface is the important word. The interface is this, this surface. One knows on the computer the word interface, this, the surface which one cannot cross. There's a space beyond it. This is a surface one can cross. It's both city space, if one walks to the top, there's this Belvedere-like space where one can overlook the whole of Karlsruhe. Or if one, one can enter here or here, um, one can sort of puncture the, the surface and actually enter into the museum. There are also glimpses through, looking down to the, to the museum spaces inside. This tower ends the, the Baroque axis of Karlsruhe. You might know the plan of Karlsruhe by Weinbrenner. This tower is the beginning of the new axis. This is the, auto, the motorway entering the city, the autobahn. Next slide, please. The old axis is horizontal, spreading from the palace at the center out, like, a, like Versailles. The new axis is vertical. It's this axis of technology which connects by a satellite to any other place on the Earth. This idea that connection is no longer literally from here to there, but it's from here to anywhere. So the satellite becomes this sort of motif, this icon of the building, or the, the satellite dish, which one drives towards as one enters. This is a the bridge is entered from the top, from this, or the, building is, the, the museum is entered from the top, from this bridge, which comes from both sides, from the railway station and from outside the city. The car parks are here. And one moves down through the library, sort of like the Guggenheim, in reverse. There's a cafe here on the end of this bridge. This is the roof, just peeping over the, uh, an existing avenue of trees. So one just sees this sort of dragon-like surface. Next slides, please. Plan of the library, museum spaces here to the front, big open space underneath the roof. Uh, not library, the museum. Then there are 
this is also um, for this is for the mixture of, of visual and um, recording and sort of audio arts. There's very sophisticated recording studios here for sound recordings in a performance theatre here, and behind this a slab of smaller studios and offices. This is a section through the studio where one sees the slope of the roof comes from this diminishing size of studio. This is the point where one enters on, on the roof of this, one saw this shape on the actual roof, sort of puncturing through. This is a sort of a terrace on top, and on top of that the cafe which sort of flies like a, um, like a little ship. These are the various layers of the building, slab at the back, roof, studios, museum spaces, and then this sort of circulation spaghetti which links it all together. Next slides, please. And the whole piece. Next slides, please. I think this building we, we consider to be a field. If one goes back to the title of the lecture, Western Objects, Eastern Fields, this, sort of, this, this flying carpet of technology is somehow, it's, 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 more, it's more a space than it is an, an object. This building is, is the opposite. This is a definite object. This is, uses the metaphor of the ship. The ship is this idea of autonomy. The ship has no context because it can be in any position. This is another German competition, this time for Kassel, for the, the Documenta, the major art exhibition. This is a new sculpture hall for the Documenta. It, this building hardly touches the ground. It flies off the edge of this escarpment. This is a, a public space in the old city. And this park goes down to the river and the, the palace. This building sort of flies ship-like off the edge. One can walk through here along this, the, the promenade, so the building is almost not there. There's also part of the building underground, but the ground level is glass, so one, one sees in, sees through. The entrance is this glass box. Next slide, please. Yeah, oh, I'm sort of walking here. The entrance is this glass box, so one enters here and then downstairs to the, to the no, upstairs to, the, to the, main, the main exhibition space or down to the second exhibition space. This is where one looks down and the building ship-like in the context, one sees this frame of this large public space, 50s theatre here. This idea, I think my, perhaps my, my prejudice with this idea of what, it, what is the status? Does architecture disappear with new technology? I think not. I think architecture's status changes. I think architecture has to be almost more present rather than less present. It has to be somehow within itself rather than part of this continuous field of information. One has to say, well, no, that is architecture and what flows through is, is information. One has to make the distinction. So one here is working with this idea of the, sort of the autonomous object. Next slide, please. Elevation of this metal box and the view from the inside, or sectional view. The machine also functions as an optical device, so this very strange view across the city. As you walk across here, one gets this very thin vertical slice of, of, of the city. One, sort of, one can sort of pan the city just by walking in the space. Next slide, please. The next two projects are on the scale of the city. They are urban design projects. Similar concepts, but I think one is now working with this concept of, of field and this concept of object. These actually preceded the two previous competition entries. This was, a, this was a, an urban study commissioned by the city of Rotterdam. Um, the city of Rotterdam, one sees here. I think this idea or from one uh, Virilio has said, things are becoming invisible. He, he's talking about our perception of the object, not the object itself. Um, cities become invisible and return very quickly. If one looks, this is Rotterdam in the 1940s. Rotterdam has today returned. This railway line, which one of the few survivors of the Second World War, which links the center of the city to, to the periphery, this grand narrative of entrance. This railway line is today being, being dug into a tunnel, so this is becoming invisible. So one has this sort of positive negative, first the city goes and the railway stays, and then the railway goes and the city returns. 
our brief was what happens to the space in the city when one has this, this cut line three kilometers long from center to, 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 to periphery. Um, half the architects asked to do this, this program chose to um, continue the urban fabric to repeat the historic, or not the historic, to repeat the existing block structures to sort of to close the wound, to sort of to pretend that this railway way was never there. I think this is somehow this. I, I re we re rejected this position. I think it, it, it it's an, a lost opportunity to make this the same as everywhere else. I think this. This idea, of this, this, this void, I think voids are opening up in our cities. This is another contemporary condition. This idea of continuous coherent space is no longer possible. And one doesn't have to say that in America because much of American cities are car parks. I think car parks are perhaps the true urban space of the 20th century. I think we should accept this. They're very fine spaces if, if, if one reads them as such and doesn't give them ridiculous facades. The question is how to, how to presence this linear void. We developed a strategy called, which was with, with two subjects. One was vectors and the other satellites. The vectors were the sort of fragmented lines of force which once joined together to form the railway, which now one, could read in, one can read in the plan. These sort of lines which point towards the center but which no longer connect. In the inner city area, this is the inner city here, the central station, this is all inner city, the river mass. In the inner city area, was the, this, the vector is like a, the head of an arrow, it's a negative vector. We frame this public space with quite small edge buildings, quite modest edge buildings, and a, a canopy here which ties together these very disparate 60s buildings. Um, we leave some existing bridge structures as sort of little vectors as well, so giving the, the railway direction. And then we introduce very small objects, which are satellites. The satellites are little things which sort of oscillate in, in this field. Um, things or objects already oscillate. This is how the trams turn around in Rotterdam at the moment. We, we developed a whole family of objects. Um, things like a moving theater. There's an existing market here, a market keeper's house. There's a moving McDonald's. Um, everything had to move in this zone. These are all the pieces we've added, and these are the with the existing buildings and block structure. There was this very curious crossing of the river. One has to get high enough up to get onto the new bridge. We placed a line of towers at intervals right across the city, this um, fragmented connection. Next two slides, please. The second zone was this one, the zone of the river and the harbor. There's, this is the bridge we saw before, island smaller channel and then the harbour district. The harbour district is basically not functioning as a harbour anymore. Some very large housing blocks have been built. These in themselves function as vectors. This existing bridge func functions as a vector. We've added these two monumental end pieces, this sort of new monument on this skyline of, Amsterdam, of Rotterdam. Here's a, a green vector, a park with satellite housing. This Social housing has no, um, no infrastructure at all. So we've added that the satellites here become little laundrettes, car, car servicing places, um, kindergartens. And finally, the line of the tunnel is underneath this empty strip in the middle. Finally, the train line comes out of the ground here. There's an area where two suburbs, this one and this one, come together. We've put another edge building to end that one, a wall building, and a little bit, a line of satellites here, and between is this green forest cut by negative vectors, these green traffic stripes. This area is called the Railway Triangle now and has a, a new triangular tower in the middle. This is a very summary description. One can list for an hour all the pieces in this. Next two slides, please. We did further propositions for this bridge, which is called the Heft Bridge. One of the, I think, 19th century landmarks of Europe is Lifting Bridge, which lifts for ships to come through. And it's quite clear that um, the train schedules don't function so well because they're not coordinated with ship schedules. Um, the tunnel is necessary. I think one of our questions today is if we are moving from mechanical technology, which was 
in a way, the subject of the modern movement, how to represent this mechanization in building. I think this question of representation is different from the technology itself. Um, if we're moving to this new realm, the question is what happens to them, these mechanical objects, these dinosaurs? Do they disappear? Do they just um, become memories? I think this is very sad if they do. Rotterdam was going to scrap these, these bridges for, and sell, or sell them for scrap iron to pay for some of the tunnel. After this project, they've decided, or after all of our projects, they've decided to keep them. I think this is a great, a great um, step in the right direction. But what happens to these objects when, when they have their function taken away? I think this is another, perhaps one of the other rules one can um, identify today, that the authority of, fu of function has come into question. I think function as a generator of architecture. Functions, in, in London today, functions are nearly always square meters of office with computer servicing. I think this is not a, an, a dignified function to make, to, to make a, a truly urban contribution. I think the architect has the responsibility of inventing other functions, or perhaps other fictions, um, to, make, to, 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 to make the building a positive contribution to the city. These, these buildings have lost their function, they're, they're no longer bridges. So the, the role here is, I think, one of re-mythologization, re to, find, to find new myths for these objects. <laughs> um, one has to somehow colonize them again. I think this is a very interesting idea. The, um, I think Roland Barthes has said that the, um, future, the, future, the future of a function is its aestheticization. Somehow these have to become sort of like sort of monsters or dinosaurs, or, no, not dinosaurs, like, like sort of monsters which occupy our city but have some other purpose. Looking at this bridge, one sees that there's a lifting mechanism still functioning. We decided, as this is no longer needed, to take it away and to design other objects to be lifted. We designed these two cafes, one here and one there, which can be lifted up and down. Can you have the next slides, please? So one doesn't go in a, in a lift to the observatory or to the, to the restaurant at the top. The, rest, the lift is the observatory or the restaurant. So these two are continually going up and down, sort of eyeballing each other. Um, I think this is a very curious situation, but somehow it, it tells you about the bridge. In fact, the history of the bridge is that it, it used to be just a con continuous bridge. The middle span was taken away and these towers were built later on the existing pylons. So then to take the middle bit away and add something else is continuing this history. It so happens that this, the island in, in the middle is quite bourgeois and this side, this, this side is quite working class. So one has this sort of ongoing history of class struggle, the sort of bourgeoisie and the working class sort of eyeballing each other from their lift carriages. The chief of the Dutch railway who owns the bridge likes this project because it's cheap. Next slide please. The second urban project is a proposition for Berlin. One knows all the EBA projects, this, the, the concept of um, reforming the 19th century city which in my opinion completely misses the whole poetry of Berlin today. The poetry of Berlin is its disconnection, its fragmentation, these, these voids which have opened up. These sort of empty spaces which, like this one, this is the cultural center of Berlin, the cultural forum which many people have d done propositions for, Hollein and Ungers. No, no one has proposed a scheme which actually can make a center because it, it, it is an empty center. It's, it, it is by definition empty, this is the nature of the city. We did a project for the exhibition Berlin Denkmal oder Denkmodell, um, Monument or Thought Pattern. Um, the Cultural Forum, which many people have d d done propositions for, Hollein and Ungers. No, no one has proposed a scheme which actually can make a center because it, it, it is an empty center. It's, it, it is by definition empty. This is the nature of the city. We did a project for the exhibition Berlin Denkmal oder Denkmodell, um, Monument or Thought Pattern. Um, just studying this space. We, we started, these are actual just drawings studying the space. One didn't know where they were lead, leading. This is as, as existing. This is the National Gallery by Mies, the Library by Sharoon, the Philharmonie by Sharoon, and this space between with traffic rushing across it. This, this is an avenue of trees here which once 
connected Paris to Moscow. I think this idea of sort of fragments of cutting is quite clearly read in this plan. The idea, one is looking for this, what is this space? I mean, I, the conclusion is that it must, it must remain empty, but then how to formalize the emptiness? Berlin is built on sand, a very unstable material. This is underneath all the buildings. Next slide, please. Our proposition is to expose the sand within this, this circular space, to actually expose the earth on which the city is built, but to make it very precious, to raise it to the height of, the, of Mises' podium. Of course, one has to keep dogs out. So this becomes this sort of perfect, or this, or this sort of empty center. We then added two buildings, um, one a bridge and one a ship, this reoccurring theme. This, of course, is no longer relevant, this picture. This bridge is in Berlin, in Wedding, in the north. It abuts the wall. It's like the bridges in Rotterdam. Its function has been um, ended abruptly. I've been recently told by Fritz Neumeyer that this is the bridge which Mies drove under every day when he was a supervising architect for the Behrens factory, the AEG factory in, in Wedding. And Fritz Neumeyer thinks this bridge is the inspiration for the, the steel beam of the National Gallery in Berlin. Our proposition is to move this bridge from here um, across East Berlin, which is now possible, to, the, to, to the, the cultural forum. This becomes the actual public space. There are only ever enough people in this, in, in, in this cultural forum, this forum of sand, to fill this amount of space. We then add small buildings, little figurative adjacencies to have a reason for being there. This is a cafe. This is called the Cafe of the North very rational and ordered. There's people in the north. This is the cafe of the south, which is more Latin. And there's a, a, a viewing tower in the middle as well, which, where one gets up to the bridge. Next slide, please. The second piece is a ship, or metaphorically a ship. We found these drawings of a ship called the, the Hafel und Spree. Hafel und Spree are the two rivers of Berlin. This is a ship which in 1900 took immigrants to America from Germany. We reversed the ship at first and then used it as a sort of template for this second building, which is a car park building. As we've, we've taken away all the space where cars park, one has to put them on a traffic island using the Japanese system of mechanical towers. So the cabins become stacked as car parking towers. And one end of the hull is folded up to become an extension of Sharoon's library. This would be a library of images of Berlin. Next slide, please. Here one sees these two pieces. The sighting is the important thing. This is the Forum of Sand, this empty circle. Mies, Sharoon, Sharoon. It's like a song. Um, the plan of Mies sort of repeats. Here, this is a second, second car park, an underground car park. This becomes a, a space for performance. And again, in negative, it frames the entrance to the Klein Music Saal, the small music hall. This is a strip of grass which cuts across the middle, which is actually, th 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 this is the park, this is the sort of sacred sand, the dog-free sand. The bridge on this axis sort of visually relates various pieces on, on the site with the small buildings behind sort of looking through or over. And the um, car parking towers and library extension connect the library or connect the two Sharoon buildings. The existing road is, 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 is allowed to cross the sand. It rises up to podium height only at this point. So here one gets a glimpse from the car across the sand. And this is a, a drawing in the style of Mies. Next slide, please. So these in theory were Western objects, but becoming more and more influenced by Eastern fields. This is an Eastern field. This is Tokyo. I have no idea where. I think Tokyo is like a hologram, a holog hologram plate. If one breaks a hologram plate, the entire image is contained in every fragment. One doesn't need to, or there, there is no hierarchical system binding the whole together. Each piece is sort of equally dense. It, one, everybody says to Tokyo is chaos, but in fact this is, these are enormously civilized spaces. This vending machine is never vandalized. 
It's because the spaces are controlled not visually but by social codes. Um, media codes as well. This is media controls the air. Next slide, please. We've done a number of projects for Japan. Our first ones were very small. This is a little sofa for the Tendo company in Tokyo. This perforated metal, the Japanese call punching metal. This is punching wood. This is a small seat, which you can buy for 40,000 yen. Um, it's a very economical storage, as spaces are small in Tokyo. There's a stool underneath the seat, so it actually seats two people. It's, it's very, very small, about sort of 12 inches by 12. Next slide, please. Two years ago, we won the first prize in the Shenkin Shiku competition. This is the, the Japan Architect magazine competition. The judge was Toyo Ito, who I had been teaching with on a workshop in Tokyo. Ito is perhaps the main... I, I'm sure you know Ito. I don't, he was here a few weeks ago. I don't have to say anything about Ito. Um, Ito is the philosopher, or the, the, yes, the philosopher for the sort of ephemeral city, the spokesman. Ito proposed this brief that the city has become ephemeral, that we have become nomads. And so what is the state of dwelling in this city? And I find this situation very problematic. We Westerners, we need our objects. Um, but one can't ignore it. So one sort of set to work thinking about it. Ito has designed the, the Tower of the Winds in Yokohama, this tower where the rings rush up and, and controlled by a very, very sophisticated computer program. We chose a site in front of the Tower of the Winds and designed this object. The question is, well, the, the object came from another quote from Virilio. Virilio wrote about an electronic shadow. I don't know what an electronic shadow is, but I like this idea very much. If one, the question was, what is the, what is the state of, status of comfort in, in the metropolis today? I mean, for me, electronic shadow would be comfort, where one could actually block out this satellite rain of information, um, a sort of a media umbrella. So it, one's talking maybe about something like a black box, something which has no form, but inside which there, there is, um, media doesn't function. But the black box itself is Cartesian. It, 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 it has a, a sort of a classical geometry. So one wanted to do a boxless black box. This is, the black shape is a found object. It's not designed, it's just something one came across at the time. A very curious shape. It is to be inflated by Oh, next two slides, please. Inflated by air borrowed from Ito's wind tower. Inside, there is a Faraday grid, which is a, a cage of wires, which, is, which one uses for protecting um, um, electronic, e electronic storage systems from, from um, radio waves. It's, it's quite easy to block out, to, block out to, to make an electronic shadow. The house is, is, is actually a visual shadow. The house only... only visually describes what happens inside and is invisible. Inside the Faraday cage is, is one sleeping mat. And one can climb up here shedding one's street clothes and sleep in this object. This object has become known as the ninja. This is a mechanical screen which attempts to block the light from Ito's tower, but because this is electronic and this is mechanical and this will kill that, this fails and we get very interesting shadow patterns on the black. And these are ninjas invading Ito's tower. We tend to get stuck with these concepts, the ship or the bridge, and now the ninja. Um, next slide, please. So when we received a commission to do an office building in Tokyo, one's first sketches were ninja in the garden. Um, it's very hard to justify to a client. <laughs> so it became a structural ninja who hold, holds the building up and is only seen in fragments at the top or from the office rooms or his little underbelly, sort of risque at the bottom. This building, next slide please. This question of, of function, as function, um, I think function follows form, this is what one would say today. This is our client, Mr. Nakamura. When I met Mr. Nakamura, I I said, this is fantastic that you want to build a building from us, what is the function? 
He said, no function. <laughs> what do you mean? Um, he said, whatever you like. If you design a building, I'll find, a, a, find someone to use it. <laughs> this, is, this is a fantastic re reversal, but it, it, it pulls the rug out of all, all the architectural precepts one has. And one, one, all, one works on this logical sequence. So this, like, one is left with the idea that you know, the, 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 building, the building actually creates itself. It sort of comes from nowhere. So one didn't know quite where to start. So we went back to London. Um, I set the task for Joey Shimoda, my able assistant in this project, who, who was in, instructed to measure this newspaper article about Mr. Nakamura. Um, one knows this article by Roland Barthes about the plan of Tokyo, that at the center of Tokyo is the emperor's palace which is invisible because nobody can ever go there. All movements in Tokyo are circular around this void. This article is almost the same. The article for me is an empty sign. It, 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 it has no meaning. I cannot read the texts. I think this idea that, that there are sort of perhaps geometries in, in signs that one has to uncover. We measured the voids. Joey measured the voids and did a very accurate survey drawing. Next slide, please. This absolutely literally became the facade wrapped around the building. This idea of um, transition from a two-dimensional to a three-dimensional object, this idea of there being no appropriate materialization for a concept. It, it might be a newspaper article or it might be on, on the scale of a building. Or it might be paper or it might be concrete. One was trying to, 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 to deal with extremes of this interchangeability. It, it, the article made a fantastic facade and better than one could have designed if one tried. The cutouts are windows. Mr. Nakamura has been removed. We actually measured him and abstracted him. I think this is his hair, the sort of square meters of his hair, and this is, I think, his tie. I've forgotten which is which now. Um, the building has lifts and staircases and a wall on this side, and this structural ninja here the structural ninja doesn't touch the ground, has splayed legs, a system used in, in Japanese um, temples, and it's an anti-earthquake system of splayed legs, so the building can move slightly. The legs, of course, too thin, thin for the earthquake laws. Um, on top, there's various roof pavilions. In fact, there was a very tight program. It's an office building with um, double floors with balconies in it, some three rentable spaces, and a basement as well, which is rentable. Next slide, please. sees it here, ninja-like. It's not necessary to show site plans for this building. It, it could be anywhere in Tokyo. The, the, the site is, is not important. What is important, perhaps, is the treatment of the surface of the earth, which is here sort of folded from the horizontal to the vertical. This has a practical reason for so one doesn't see through that there's a messy site behind and there's light in here. But this idea that, that, the, that the, of one thing transforming into an, an, another, horizontal becoming vertical, is one of the themes of the building. Next slide, please. At the ground, on the ground plane, the building is almost not there. There's the legs of the ninja, the lift and the staircases, and these rocks which are to stop cars driving off the edge. These are, these are, these are fluorescent pink. Kodak film doesn't pick up fluorescent pink and have light coming out from underneath them. They're sort of like electronic rock gardens. Next slide, please. Um, unfortunately, one has to be very honest, this project will not be built. After working for one year on it, we received a fax from Mr. Nakamura saying that he had seen a television program on Prince Charles and he sent a picture of a, cl a classical building and said, could we make it like that? <laughs> one knows this situation from England and I think in retrospect, if one does a project based on media, one has to be, pre be prepared to take the consequences of other media information. <laughs> without any value judgments, that is. This project is actually built. This is a small... Christian Marflay. Morphosis, ourselves and a number of other people, have just... ...in Osaka. This is for an expo of gardens and greenery, um, which opened on April Fool's Day. 
This, this is a small building, again a building which started without function. One had, the, the, had to do a small building in a, in a plaza in a major exhibition of gardens. The site was 10 by 10 meters. One has to invent the whole narrative oneself. I think, again, as one invents the narrative, the building finds its form. After this, um, the, the author expo authorities found us a client as well. The client is a Japanese city called Otsu City. And this is the exhibition pavilion of Otsu City. But we designed it before we knew that. We started designing this time, or using one of our favorite motives, the ship. But this time the submarine, this idea of this continuous surface. A surface perhaps like in Karlsruhe. But Karlsruhe was in, is in two dimensions. The submarine is in three dimensions. A surface which folds back on itself and has no seam. We, we did a series of drawings which were in the New York exhibition of distorting submarines, almost sort of like pressing a balloon to the point where it bursts. From that one has actually one produced three distinct forms. One, the, sort of the skin, this a black shape. One, a, a skeletal frame, which almost could have come from inside this. And one, a sort of the third closing piece for the other side of this triangular building. This is almost trans, translucent or translucent skin. These three pieces, this is called the salon, this is called the water machine, this is called the, the screen, stand on top of a pool. This is a computer sketch. I'm very bad on a computer, it happened by accident. The colors were meant to be all black. Next slide, please. This was a sketch model we made. The, the scheme was actually designed with this model. Next slide, please. Last week, I went to Osaka to find it waiting. Um, it opened, in fact, the opening ceremony is probably happening now. Um, it's not actually finished. I, I find it very hard to sort of say, say very much about this project because I sort of flew from the site to Los Angeles this, this, this morning, today. These pictures were taken this morning. Um, I think maybe I'll, I'll, I'll point out which, uh, what object is what. It's not finished, as you can see, and at the end of this will, will be the end of my lecture. Um, this is the water machine. This one is a rusting frame with water pipes which will drip very slowly. And this fan will hopefully blow air through, evaporating the water, and there'll be a cooling cloud hovering over a path just here. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, a screen, a sort of a curved screen made up from, of three panels, one, two, one, two, and the third side. There's a cut between each panel, so one, so that one actually sees through to the inside of the folly. The inside is another color which Kodak Film refuses to register. It's fluorescent yellow, absolutely sort of blinding yellow. Um, next slide, please. Well, it's, it's between yellow and green. It's an ex the exposition, the theme of the exhibition is gardens and greenery. There's nothing, nothing natural in this folly, only this very artificial green color. All other materials, the canvas has its own color. There's, there's wood pieces have their own co color, or there's black pieces, which is the color of ninjas. The yellow is the only, uh, only artificial color applied. After we, we started negotiating with our clients, Otsu City, we worked out how to use this empty shed as an exhibition pavilion for them and designed this video ninja with four very large video screens which stand in the middle of the object. So this becomes the, sort of the, the house of media information, which I think is a very appropriate function for it. And it fits the series of projects I've explained, or the theories I've been explaining. The object is, is very different from um, whichever side one looks. From the back, one sees the, the two noses. From the front, one sees this screen or this space. There's a bridge here which passes through through this, the salon, and there's a small office here which leans away from the salon. Next slides, please. This is a bridge passing through. This, way, this is a pool of water here with a grid of lights which will shine directly upwards through the water. Next slides, please. The 
this is sort of underneath the, the ninja. Next slide, please. I'm not quite sure what to say about this. This, ele this electrician put all the wires in the wrong place. I don't like him at all. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, screen hasn't yet been tightened. It will be very, very crisp, I assure you. This is the office, leaning away from the pavilion. Next slide. Oh yes, those are trees. Those are, that's, an, uh, that's a, a, a landscape where we've designed, we've, we've designed the, the, the arrangements of trees, or just sort of clumps of forests. Some are existing and some are... Sort of right, what I'm asking is, how important to you is the planting? They're so abstract that they're almost solid. Well, they're actually not solid. They're just um, I think they're in a different realm to the subjects I was dis discussing. I mean, one, I think you know, it's always fantastic a, a building a building next to trees or, or next to next to some, some something which is growing and changing is fantastic, but it's 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 not something one can actually say in a, in a lecture because it's something one must experience. It's a sort of quality in itself. I think it would be you know, pretentious to say that this tree will grow up and fulfil my concept. I think trees are, have a life of their own and do what they want. You know, one, one, one does include them in, in their thinking, but it's, it's not a major part of our theory. One more? Okay, thank you. It's those slides of mine. I really must change the mounts. Well, or we gotta get a pair of salts or something. It's yeah, and, and one, one cannot get thinner mounts in, in, in Germany. I mean, I, I get all my stuff in Germany now, and th that's that's the standard thing. Yeah. But I, I always have this trouble in America. Yeah. Okay. Well, no problem. It's great. Thanks a lot. It's a wonderful presentation. Really enjoyed yeah. that. Thanks. Thank you. I'm turn your mic. Ah. Oh. I forgot to mention, Joey. <laughs> One has to think on one's feet. Bit of a self-chew act. Waiting, waiting for the next slide.